Hello, everyone, and welcome, dear listeners, to the next episode of Susan Lopresti Wellness, Mind, Body, and Soul, the podcast where we explore the highs, the lows, and everything in between when it comes to a woman's life, her health, and all aspects of navigating the midlife landscape. I'm your host, Susan Lopresti, and today's topic is not something that I would normally talk about on my podcast because it doesn't just pertain to midlife women. The disease that I wanna talk about today doesn't discriminate against anyone. You could be male, female, young, old. You could be highly successful or you could be standing on the street corner begging for money. You could come from a great family or you could come from a really dysfunctional family. It doesn't really matter because the disease that I'm talking about today is the disease of addiction. Now, first and foremost, and I used to feel like this myself, hearing that addiction is a disease kind of could get you really pissed off because if you have cancer as a disease, you may not have control over a cure or not. The disease that I'm talking about, the disease of addiction, I feel like is a disease that can be cured. However, not everyone who has that disease has been giving the grace and the blessing of being cured or going into recovery. So it's not a topic that I would normally want to talk about on my podcast, even though I do have addiction that runs in my family, or I should say I do have family members who struggled with addiction and It was very, very close in my own life. It wasn't me, but it was someone who I love dearly. And when you love someone, it's really painful to watch them go through this addiction. So the reason why I'm talking about this topic today is because very recently we had the passing of Matthew Perry, and that was devastating to me. And I did know that he went through addiction. I did know that he struggled while he was on Friends. I had read about it. I knew when he was in the hospital where his intestines, I believe, burst or his colon, which was in regards to his addiction and taking Vicodin. I believe he was taking 55 Vicodin a day when he was on friends. And that certainly messes with your digestive system. You become totally constipated. You can't have a bowel movement and it just builds up in your colon and in your intestines. And I mean, that'll kill you. He was lucky that I think in his book, he said there were five people on ventilators that night. Four of them didn't make it and he did. And then a short time later, the addiction got to him anyway. And even if maybe he was still sober, I don't even know the details. I don't think they've come up with a full autopsy report to see if there were any drugs in the system. I know they didn't find any at the scene where he passed away. So who knows what it's all about. And then I don't know if any of you are General Hospital fans. I've been a General Hospital fan since I was probably nine years old. I grew up in Brooklyn in a brownstone and with all family in the house. And my grandfather lived downstairs and he was retired at the time. And I used to go downstairs to his apartment at four o'clock in the afternoon to watch Dark Shadows for any of you 
who remember Dark Shadows, Barnabas Collins, back in the 70s. So anyway, I would go down before four o'clock because we'd have a snack and get ready for Dark Shadows. But my grandpa, he used to watch General Hospital. So being that I was down there early with him, I started watching General Hospital and here I am, 63 and a half years old, and I do still watch General Hospital and The Young and the Restless. I used to watch One Life to Live and All My Children, but they took them off the air. So that's what I still watch. Anyway, the reason why I bring up General Hospital is because Tyler Christopher who, if you don't watch General Hospital or never watch General Hospital, he played Nicholas Cassidyne for over 25 years. And he won awards. He's a great actor. And I knew that they recasted him some years back, but I didn't know why. I didn't know if it was his choice to leave. Like, I'm not really a big follower of the stars and movie stars. So, but anyway, I found out that he passed away. And finding out that he passed away, they said it was from a heart attack. And then I found out that he actually was let go from General Hospital and another show that he was on, I think The Bold and the Beautiful. And he was let go because of his drinking and I think his erratic behavior on set as well, which I didn't know that at the time. And anyway, about a year ago, pr pretty much a year to the month when he passed away, a year prior to that, Sonny Corintos on General Hospital, Maurice Bernard in real life, he has a YouTube channel that's called State of Mind because Maurice has bipolar, and he has suffered with depression, and he's very open about that. So he has this YouTube channel about mental awareness, mental health. And he had Tyler Christopher on, I guess, a few months after he got sober. And he did a whole hour and a half show with Maurice talking about his downward spiral, his struggles with trying to stop and so on and so forth. After I watched that video, then I learned that he actually did relapse after that video was published or recorded. And I think he was back to drinking. I don't know where he was in the, st in the phase of addiction when he died. And again, like Matthew Perry, they're waiting on a full autopsy report. But, you know, it's really terrible because another soap opera star that comes to mind who also recently passed from General Hospital and he also played Dylan on The Young and the Restless, he died. He battled bipolar and depression and his mom confirmed on social media that basically he took himself out of this world. So he ended his own life. Uh, I don't know if addiction was part of his disease of mental illness or not, but it's just so shocking that so many young people and famous people too, which, you know, you would think like they have all the money in the world. They could have anything they want. They have so many blessings and yet they struggle with addiction. And so it doesn't discriminate. Like I was saying in the beginning, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, famous or not, intelligent, if you went to college, if you're a doctor, a lawyer, some kind of professional, or you're doing blue collar work, whatever it is, no matter who you are, it doesn't discriminate. But let's go back to it being a disease, because I feel like a lot of diseases you don't have control over. Once you're diagnosed with something, a lot of these diseases you can't turn around. Addiction, you can, but it's so interesting to see that 
although you can, so many people that struggle with addiction weren't able to. So the ones who found sobriety, that's a blessing. They have been blessed with a gift that you can't put a price tag on because I can tell you firsthand what it's like to love someone who's an addict. It's horrible. It's horrible. It's devastating. It's one of the hardest things that I've ever experienced up until today. I hope it never gets any worse than that. And, you know, for the person who loves an addict, I have to tell you that you really need to get well before you could do anything for that addict. And I didn't know that. So when I first went to Al-Anon, my first meeting at Al-Anon, I was working in the city and I went, my God, it took me over a half hour. I decided to walk there, not realizing how far away it was. And I walked into a lunchtime meeting and I went in there thinking that these people were going to tell me how to stop, how to have my addicted person in my life stop using. And so when I went into this meeting and I heard all these people talking about themselves and their problems and all of this, I was like, I don't want to be here. I don't care about your problems. I want an answer to my problem. And I wasn't getting that. So I left that Alan on meeting and I decided that I wasn't going back. And then a friend of mine who was also in Al-Anon, who knew my situation, she said to me, she said, Susan, why don't you come to an Al-Anon meeting that I go to? Maybe you'll like it better. And this Al-Anon meeting is going to be an anniversary meeting, which is different than, you know, a regular Al-Anon meeting. So there'll be speakers that come up and you'll hear what they have to say and something may resonate with you and touch on something. And I said, okay, I'll go. So it was her and I and another friend of hers. And we went to this anniversary meeting where I live. And I thought maybe different class of people or whatever. So anyway, the first woman that gets up to speak, she gets up and she says, have you ever noticed that every alcoholic home has a magic window? And people started laughing. And I didn't know what they were talking about and why they were laughing. The hell is a magic window? And then she goes on to explain what it is. And she says, you know, the window that the family members who are waiting for the alcoholic to come home, they stand by that window waiting for the, the car to come down the street. And they think that if they stand at the window, somehow that's going to magically bring the alcoholic home quicker and safe. And the whole room burst out laughing. And I got so freaking pissed off. I was fuming mad. Do you want to know why I was fuming mad? Because I had that fucking alcoholic magic window that I used to stand in front of in my bedroom every night waiting for my alcoholic person to come home. So I didn't think that was funny. And I was like, why are all these people laughing? Because I felt like they were laughing at me. And I didn't think it was funny because those nights of standing in front of the, that window and pacing back and forth and beeping and calling and wondering and scared. And that wasn't fun. That wasn't funny. Why are these people laughing? So at break time, you know, they put the money in the basket and they give you a coffee break. Everybody drinks coffee in AA in Al-Anon. 
everyone's drinking coffee. Anyway, so we go stand outside. My friends are smokers, so we go outside. And I'm crying because I'm like, I hate this fucking thing. I'm never coming back here again. This is bullshit, blah, blah, blah. And my friend's friends, that I know her through her, she put her arm around me and she said, girl, I'm going to tell you something. You may not come back tomorrow, but when you do come back, you'll be coming back on your knees, crawling, begging for help. And I said, yeah, I don't think so. And anyway, I got in my car and I left. I didn't stay for the rest of the meeting. Well, fast forward, I don't know how many months. I did. I went back to a meeting, not there, somewhere else, by my home. And the woman that was speaking when I walked in, When she saw me walk in, she stopped speaking. She leaned over to a woman that was next to her, whispered in her ear. The woman looked at me. She switched places with the woman who was speaking. And that woman walked to me in the back. And she put her arm around me. And she brought me into a private room. Why? because I was practically on my knees. I was hysterical. I had nowhere else to turn, no one that I wanted to talk to about this, and I didn't know what else to do. And that friend of a friend was right. And I didn't like Ellen on. I didn't like it at all because I had to look at my own shit, right? I had to look at my shit because it takes two to tango in an alcoholic home. And I was keeping the secrets. I wasn't sharing with his family or my family or my friends that I had an alcoholic living in my house with me who was, by the way, a complete stranger from the person that I originally met. We're talking a completely different person. You know the movie Sleeping with the Enemy? And no, he wasn't abusive in any way to me, thank God. But he was the enemy because we were not for each other. We were against each other. And... When I did start going to Al-Anon, by the way, and I also went into another program that was affiliated with a hospital, it was called the SO program, so it stood for Significant Others, and that met every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, and that was significant others in a room with a therapist, and we just went around and we spoke a lot. And each one of us got a chance to speak. And I went to Al-Anon. And Al-Anon, I did more listening than speaking. But I had the book, Keep It Simple. And I read a lot of the Al-Anon literature. And I started practicing the Al-Anon ways and following the steps. And what I started to notice that when your behavior changes, So does the other person's behavior. But that other person never got to the point of sobriety, never really wanted it. And so I used to threaten and say I was going to do this and I was going to do that and this and that and this and that. But I lasted for 28 years in that marriage. And finally, when I just couldn't take it anymore, and with the help of counseling and getting stronger, and I used to listen to meditation tapes, and I think they really helped me. And what I realized was that I was codependent, and I was an enabler, and he fit what I needed in my life. And I want to read something from a book that's called The Gift. I read this line. I suggested that maybe they weren't the ones with the need. Maybe she was. Sometimes 
we have the need to be needed. We don't feel we're functioning well if we're not rescuing people. But when you depend on being needed, you're likely to marry an alcoholic. Speaking for myself, I grew up with a very big family. Not my immediate family. It was just me, my brother, my mom, and my dad. But my mom has, I don't know, 12 or 13 brothers and sisters, and they all have kids. So I have a ton of cousins on my mom's side. My dad was one of seven. Not all his sisters and one brother had kids, but there were a lot of kids. I have a lot of cousins on that family. I happen to be the youngest member of my dad's family and pretty much one of the youngest. I would say one out of, there's probably four cousins a little bit younger than me and a lot of older cousins. Like I have cousins that are in their 80s. I have one cousin who now passed away, but her and my mom were actually the same age. She's a few months younger than my mom because my mom's mother was pregnant with my mom and her brother's wife was pregnant with my cousin. So anyway, there's needless to say, there's a large family. And I grew up in the 60s and back then you heard the saying all the time, Children were meant to be seen, not heard. So when we went to someone's house for company, we're not like the kids today that all the attention is on the kids. No, we sat there, maybe we colored or we played with a little toy that we brought, or me and my brother would play a game together. My brother was very rambunctious. He was all over the place. I was very shy and quiet. And I always used to feel like, Maybe if I just don't say anything, no one will even notice me and want to come over and talk to me or make conversation with me because I hated that. I hated that. And so I wasn't seen. I wasn't heard. I wasn't given a lot of attention, believe it or not. And some people, if my family's on here listening, you may be saying, oh, she's so full of shit. Her father loved her to death or her mom but you know what, guys? You don't really know what goes on behind closed doors. You're not going to say things in front of other people that you would say to your kids in private or make them feel a certain way in private just by their reactions and just by their complaints about life and how it's because of you kids that we have no money, that we're struggling, that I have to pay uh, all this money in tuition. And me and my brother used to say all the time, it's not our fault that you move to this crappy neighborhood where the schools are not safe, the public schools are not safe enough to send us. It's not our fault. We didn't ask to be born. This is on you. Don't put the blame on us. And so, you know, it's interesting because my brother doesn't have children and I don't know why that's a private issue but I don't know why and I would never ask him it could be because he didn't want to have children or it could be because they weren't able to that's their business but honestly I didn't want to have children either I had no desire to have a child and I was married like six years, five years. And, you know, I was getting pressure from not my side of the family, but the other side of the family. Why aren't you having any kids yet? And I was like, no, I don't like kids. I don't want kids. Well, P.S., I ended up getting pregnant by accident and I really didn't want to have an abortion. I always thought that like it would be no big deal, but when push came to shove, I didn't want to. And no judgment because I I am pro-choice. And so I don't have any judgment about that. Everyone's individual situation is different. What I do know is that when I found out I was pregnant, I already really wanted to get divorced. 
But I decided, which, you know, you think that things are going to change, right? What's going to change? That I would give it another try. And anyway, it didn't work out. It doesn't really matter. I just want to talk about this disease and how devastating it is, not just for the person, but for everybody else who loves this person. It's so hard to watch. You see the health deteriorating. When you go on social media and you watch one reel of Matthew Perry, all of a sudden you're bombarded with tons and tons of reels. And I started becoming like a little bit obsessed because, you know, like I said, addiction, I know about it. I experienced it myself firsthand, what it's like to love someone who's struggling and whatever else. And so I started watching all these reels of Matthew Perry when he was young and performing on Friends and how funny he was and how great. And then as he was getting older, where he was being interviewed, and I just saw, listen, we all get old. I don't look the way I did when I was 21, when I was 18. I get it. But you can see when someone is really beat up and that's lifestyle right some people will age better than others i think that we have let's go to some health coaching right now i think we have control over how we age and how we could stay work to stay healthy there are no guarantees in life the healthiest people can get diagnosed with cancer, but we can do what we could do to maintain and preserve health and to age gracefully. And that's what this podcast is all about. That's what my health coaching programs are all about. It's about aging gracefully, staying healthy, living a healthy lifestyle. So when you look at these folks who have really gone through the mill, right, gone through the war, basically, it's a war, it's them against the drug. And like Matthew Perry talks about how he struggled, how he struggled, Tyler Christopher, the same how he used to try and try to stop. And sometimes it takes losing your health. And then other times, not even that. Not even that. It takes you down. It kills you. And you know, when I first started health coaching, I thought about health coaching and working with women who have an addict in their life that they're struggling with because I was able to really pull myself out of that situation and make a better life for myself. But at the time, I couldn't see past my nose. It had to get to the point of it being so unbearable that I just couldn't, I couldn't. I would wake up in the morning, open my eyes and say, what the fuck is going to happen today? Because every day, it was something new. And none of it was good. It was so hard. It was so hard. And I think they say that for every one person, there's like two or three people that they know who suffer with addiction. I think it used to be that was the statistic years ago. I really didn't come on researching any statistics today. I'm just speaking from experience and from my heart and from what I know. So what I'm going to go back and say about Al-Anon and AA also, because what I started doing was I started going to AA meetings because I wanted to understand the alcoholic mind, the addict's mind, what goes through their heads. 
And, you know, as I started listening, sitting in the back of the room, I would sit in the back of the room, it would be an open meeting, and recovering addicts would get up and speak, and they would tell their story, and it started to make a little bit of sense. And not only that, but it helped me to understand what this person that I loved was going through. And even though I loved this person, I had to learn to love me and my daughter more. And so with the help of a lot of people, not much family, I'm going to say the truth, because I hid it from my family. I hid it from my family because there were some family members that didn't want me to marry this person to begin with. And it wasn't because they thought he was an alcoholic. It was because he wasn't my nationality. And I'm going to leave it at that. And I was disowned from my family in a way. They didn't throw me out. I lived in their house. But I wasn't allowed to go to any kind of a family function. And I'm Italian. And Italian people have celebrations. There's a lot of parties. There's a lot of celebrating. There's a lot of holidays. And I was allowed to go, according to my parents' rules, only if I went alone. So I didn't go because I was being spiteful, because they were being spiteful. And basically, they were just prejudiced. They were prejudiced. They are racist, even though they raised me not to be. Oh, we said everybody's equal and you know everybody was equal until it hit their family and then they weren't equal anymore and you know what if they would have given this person that was in my life the opportunity to know him and him know them they may have seen the signs to say hey i think he could be headed down the wrong road Open your eyes to that. We really like him. Maybe we could help him. But no, because of that, and I dug my heels in, and I ended up getting married. And I was madly in love. And I chose him over my whole entire family. And you know what? The interesting thing was that in the end, when everybody did get to know him, and they all loved him because he's, very likable and he is you know charming and turns on the charm and especially if he has a couple of drinks in him the charm is like going strong up until he would get to the point of being obnoxious but in the beginning of it he was very charming and very cordial to everyone and welcoming and friendly and that's just the way he is and so many of my family members would tell me that yeah your parents went about it in the wrong way so believe me when I say that I've been through it myself and I know what it's like and I feel for the families of Matthew Perry and Tyler Christopher and Tyler Christopher he's got young children and They didn't live near him. They lived, I think, in St. Louis, and he was in L.A., and he would visit them once a month for three days when he got sober. And I don't know how long it was since he relapsed, but that video that Maurice Bernard did with him was a year old. But sometime after that, he did relapse. And anyway, I don't know how he really died yet. They say heart attack, but... There could have been drugs or alcohol involved, or just the fact that 
you abused your body for so many years that it just gives out on you. And I know that firsthand as well. A destroyed life and a destroyed family. Because I think without the disease of alcoholism, we probably could have made it. And the interesting thing about me and my ex that a lot of people can't wrap their head around and sometimes I laugh when I get the reaction from them but he and I are really good friends I mean really good friends to the point where I went to stay nine days at his house with him because his girlfriend had to go watch her grandkids for seven days and he can't be alone. And there was no one else to ask. And so they asked me and I said, yes. And we had a great time together. We hung out and I really didn't take care of him. It's just to be there in case he needs something because he's in really bad physical condition. He actually has more than nine lives. He's probably has uh, nine, eight, two, maybe 27 lives at this point because he's been given a lot of chances in life. I'm not a professional counselor in any way. I just have a ton of experience with the disease of alcoholism and, you know, drug abuse. And so if anybody on here wants to talk about that, if you want to be on my podcast and share your story, I would love to have you. If you're struggling and you want to talk about that, you could go to my website, www.susanlopresti.com. And from there, you can schedule a free health assessment with me. It doesn't need to be about your health. If you want to talk about that, I would be happy to talk to you about that. Maybe you want to hear more of my journey. Maybe you just want to unload your journey, whatever it is. I've helped women in the past, friends of mine that I knew. I've offered my help to a lot of women who never took me up on it. But somehow, I think I've helped them. Just to share my story makes you realize that you're not alone. And even for the person who's struggling, if they're willing, if they really want to, they can get into a program and make it happen. It's a gift that God gives to some that some never find. What it is exactly, why it is, I don't know. I don't know. But at some point, if you're the person in an addict's life, you need to stop focusing on the addict and start focusing on your recovery and loving yourself more than that person, because that was part of my problem. I didn't even see my own self-worth. I remember sitting in a therapy session with a therapist I was seeing in Manhattan, and the day before I had had my hair highlighted and cut and it was all blown out. So I went to the session the next day and we were sitting there and she said to me, Susan, could I ask you a question? So I said, yeah. And this was uh, probably 30 years ago, maybe a little bit less than that. She said, do you know how beautiful you are? Do you know how lucky someone would be to find a woman like you? You are a great mom, from what I know. You have a career. And you have a wonderful way about you. And not only that, you're beautiful inside and out. Do you realize that? And I was like, no, I don't realize that. I don't think that of myself. I don't see me as being beautiful. I don't see me as being smart. I don't think I have a great career. And I don't feel like I'm a great mom because I out of the house. 12 hours a day trying to make ends meet because the alcoholic in my life is spending money on drugs and alcohol and leaving us 
high and dry. So I've been through it. And I can tell you that nothing stays the same forever. And I can also tell you that when you change your behavior, the person in your life who's the addict is going to see that change in you and they're going to start reacting differently with you and you'll see an improvement. And one thing that I'll never forget is that they said that when you look at the alcoholic, you need to see on their forehead I am an alcoholic. I am sick. So when you're dealing with them, you have to keep that in mind. You are not dealing with someone who's in their right mind. Even when they're sober, they're not sober. They have alcoholic behavior. Whether they're sober, dry sober, or drunk for the day, or feeling hungover from the day before, they're never in their right mind. And the disease will progress. It used to go from every other day of drinking, drink, recovery day, drink, recovery day, drink, recovery day, to every day drinking. Drink, 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 drink. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday was a marathon drinking. How many cases of beer could we go through in a weekend? Then let's start Friday night. It was rough. It was terrible for my daughter. I hope she doesn't listen to this episode. But you know what? I don't want to sugarcoat. There's someone out there right now that's listening to this podcast that needs to hear what I'm saying. You need to hear it. So I'm saying it. It's not easy. And there's a reason why you're with this person and you can't disconnect from them. And you know, when I finally got the balls to make that disconnection and separate, I had a mantra. Dear God, please take care of so-and-so for me because I can't do it anymore. That's what I used to pray. It was simple. It was simple. And for whatever reason, God had a different plan. And it took a long time for that person to find sobriety. It practically killed him. And so when I think about these famous people that have everything going for them, and they're in the same shoes, it's so heartbreaking. And you see, it doesn't discriminate. And don't keep it a secret. If you keep it, you're feeding it. You're making it larger. I found that when I finally shouted it from the rooftop to everyone, who already, by the way, you think it's a secret, everybody else knew it way before you even came to grips with it. That's another thing I want to talk about, by the way, is that to actually say those words and to admit that, yes, this person is an alcoholic or a drug addict, when you make that statement, everything in your life as you know it is going to change. And it's hard to get there. Believe me, it took a long time to get there to say those words. And then it took a long time after that, I was in recovery, just like the addict would be. The people that deal with the addict, it's a dance. It's a dance. And you're part of that dance, whether you realize it or not. And sometimes when you cut the cord, that's all that person needs to say, that's it. I need to recover. Other people will just gravitate to people who are going to pick up the slack where you left off. Because, you know, I've heard in AA that God takes care of babies and alcoholics and addicts more than anyone. He protects them. Because addicts are like babies. You're not alone. There's millions of people just like you in your shoes. I would never want to be in those shoes again. It was the hardest part of my life. But I will tell you that I have changed dramatically 
from the person I used to be. So out of something bad always comes something good. And when I was able to let go and move on, sold our house, I moved with my daughter, we went somewhere else, my life immediately started improving, 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 improving. It was very hard. I had a lot of guilt. I felt responsible, especially as his declined and declined and declined and declined. Mine uh, was going up and his was going down. But I had to learn that it wasn't my responsibility any longer. You know that bullshit when you get married in sickness and in health? I don't think it always should apply. I really don't because I believe that you need to stay healthy. And if someone is dragging you down, you need to cut that cord and don't get dragged down with them. No matter how much you love them, no matter how you feel about marriage or commitment or vows or religious beliefs, love yourself first. You only get one life to live. Don't destroy it. Don't let the disease of addiction bring you down, whether you're the addict or the loved one of an addict. At some point, cut the cord. They don't want your help. They don't need your help. You're only enabling them to continue to go on doing the things they're doing. I feel pretty complete about this episode today. I think I've said a lot. And again, I'm going to tell you, please, if you are struggling and you want to talk, I'm happy to listen. I would welcome them. So follow me here. Make sure that you're following me on my podcast, also on my YouTube channel. This way, when I release another episode, you'll be sure to be notified and you could go listen and go to my website, www.susanlopresti.com. I do a lot of health coaching programs on there. I'm also a Reiki practitioner. Start taking care of yourself. So maybe you want a Reiki session with me. I'd be happy to do that. I do it virtually all the time. It works just as well as it does in person. And start practicing self-care. Start putting yourself first. Start being selfish and do what you can. I highly recommend Al-Anon or any other kind of therapy to get you through this terrible time because it's a terrible time. And it could go on for years and years. It could go on a lifetime. Someone's got to put the brakes on. Let it be you. Thank you so much again for listening. I appreciate each and every one of you. Until the next time, stay well, be happy, and bye for now.